Welcome back to the Kobe. Genus Brewing Show. Oh, I had the perfect introduction. Oh yeah, the eight, the equal sign, and then the uh, yeah. D, and then a the capital D. She also knows how to spell boobies upside down on a calculator. On that note, <laughs> welcome back to the Genus Brewing Channel. Today we are discussing yeast with you, and specifically, some myths, myth, con myth conceptions, myth, con myth conceptions. <laughs> we're talking. We're, we have uh, some expert clips from the guys at Imperial Yeast, Jess and Owen. Uh, they're going to go over some quality control stuff that they uh, use in their process. Things that are pretty unattainable for you at home, so you can learn a little bit more about how yeast is made, and uh, hopefully, we can show you some stuff that you may or may not be doing wrong to date. So let's go ahead and start by introducing Jess and Owen to you. Hey, uh, my name is Owen. I own Imperial Yeast. Uh, I do customer service and sales uh, and then some long-term planning and owner stuff started it about well I started working on it about five years ago we've been running about three years um, you know I wanted to start it because I worked at a different yeast lab and thought I could do a much better job um, I'm Jess Cadell I'm a microbiologist and I do the tech support and help run the lab I've been in the brewing industry for about I don't know, 22 years as a brewer and um, I also worked at another yeast company before coming here. Um, you know, we like to concentrate on growing some great yeast, making a great product, and giving all the tech support that we can to help brewers um, utilize their yeast well and, and uh, make good beer. Obviously, these guys have been in the business. They should know what they're doing with yeast and should know how to grow yeast. Uh, but at home, a lot of people think that they can grow yeast, they can harvest yeast, they can wash yeast just as well as the pros. So we got a couple myths uh, to talk about in relation to that, uh, but just so you have a better idea of everything that it takes to be good at growing yeast in the cleanliest possible way, let's uh, have Jess and Ellen run down some of the quality control measures that they use uh, in their own yeast growing facility. So at the lab here we have a couple autoclaves that we use to sterilize a lot of the lab parts and pieces that we use for QC, including medias, um, equipment. Some of the parts on our fermentation vessels will sterilize, you know, specifically parts that are not easy to clean and sanitize on their own. Throughout our production process we run quality control on a lot of uh, parts. To start out with we check our we have a sterile water system so we'll check to make sure that our water is actually sterile we use that water to blend with our media and we also use that water to blend with our finish yeast to dilute it to the exact specs for cell count um, then we'll also check our media so we um, unlike a brewery who boils their liquid or wort we heat it up to about 245 fahrenheit under pressure to make sure we're getting a good fast kill we want to make sure that there isn't anything in there besides the yeast that we're trying to grow and we also utilize pcr to test for diastaticus so as you can see they're using what plating techniques they're using autoclaves they're pressure cooking their pressure wort. cooking their wort um so those are things that while yeah you probably could do those at home they're fairly unattainable um kind of out of the realm for most people uh, so when it comes to things like washing yeast you know that's one of those things that a lot of people like to do but why might that be bad Peter? Uh, washing yeast actually can be negative to the yeast uh, for a couple different reasons uh, first and foremost is the beer that you just fermented in probably isn't the best growth medium for the yeast uh, we'll get into that a little bit later uh, we do have a clip from Jess and Owen kind of talking about why that is but uh, uh, the bottom line is that washing yeast can damage your yeast you're going from a concentrated uh, warm mixture of, of yeast and all the stuff that you just had beer with uh, to a very uh, nothing is in it watery kind of environment and that isn't great for the yeast especially at room temperature because then the yeast have nothing else to consume and they just kind of eat themselves yeah and another big thing is that uh, you know Jess and Owen talked about how literally every part of their system, um, everything that goes into their system is filtered and then tested. And uh, every time that you open any vessel that you're brewing in, any, any vessel that has any yeast, any beer, anything that is coming in contact with the beer is a chance of contamination, right? Uh, so these guys are not only filtering everything, plating everything, but they're also using completely closed systems. And that's something that 
is most pretty much you can't do. It. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say I was it's like impossible to do. I was like, I don't care how good of a system you've got. I I highly doubt it's completely closed. And so if you're reusing yeast, especially if you're using it over and over and over again, uh, you're you're gonna get something else in there. And then when you're doing your starter, you're not just growing your yeast; you're growing a different yeast. Uh, take on top of that the fact that your yeast is gonna mutate in consecutive batches. Uh, all in all, reusing yeast once or twice is a pretty good idea if you kind of know what you do it. But the best way to do it isn't to wash and store yeast for a long time. The best way to do it is just pitch on top of a cake that you just used and plan on dumping the batch after that. Yeah. So this kind of goes on to the fact that uh, something that we kind of do here, but we also oxygenate the crap out of it, which is using beer as a growing medium of yeast. Uh, one of the things yeast really need is oxygen, uh, and beer goes anaerobic pretty fast, and on top of that, you've got the alcohol stress. So we're going to let kind of, uh, I think as Jess talk a little bit about um, you know, the techniques that they're using there to avoid that stress and they keep those cells as healthy as possible when they're actually trying to grow healthy yeast cells for you. You know, the biggest part of healthy yeast is that that yeast was grown in a good media, nutrient-rich media. Um, you know, if that yeast is coming from a supplier, that that uh, whole propagation was done under aeration and that that yeast was handled properly after the uh, propagation was done and stored cold. Um, I think the biggest the biggest thing is you know you try to use your yeast quickly. You try not to store it a long time. You try not to let that yeast get too warm. Pitch rate is super important. That's kind of what we were founded on was trying to deliver the right pitch rate to people. I think a lot of yeast companies in the past have tried to sell home brewers too little yeast. Um, what happens then is you experience a way different fermentation on that first pitch than you do on the yeah. second or the third yeah. if you're repitching, or you experience such huge problems that your beer is ruined. So um, a lot of our customers might give us a little pushback in the beginning when we ask them to spend more money on yeast or buy more yeast, but after they do it, it's never a problem. Um, they can use that yeast a lot more if they need to repitch or want to repitch, and their beer tastes the same on that batch as it does on the next ones. So as you can see, there's a lot of things that they are doing, they're taking into account that we just can't do and aren't doing when we're brewing beer. Things like constantly oxygenating during the process to ensure proper growth, uh, obviously you don't do that when you're making beer. Because you you want the alcohol in your beer for one thing. Yeah, um, yeah these guys, they, their goal is not to make beer, their goal is to grow yeast. Uh, they literally told me in the tour, they said, I am more than welcome to drink any of the beer they make, but it really doesn't taste that that good because of that constant oxygenation because it's I think they said they keep it it's like three and a half percent and never gets over that so that creates the low stress environment and they're transferring off the supernatant uh, as soon in the process as they can so that the yeast isn't sitting in poison yeah so with this said it isn't impossible to try to mimic this try to replicate it at home so you know Peter tell, tell them what's the best way to do that at home so instead of trying to save your big batch of yeast and then uh, wash it wash it, it's not a true wash, uh, and then reuse that. The best way to do it is actually keep a yeast bank. Uh, keep a, uh, small vials of all your yeast in the most sanitary possible way you can, and cold, and then grow that up per batch. Uh, I actually know of another YouTuber that has a video on his yeast bank that he keeps and how he handles that. I'll link that below. <laughs> so next we're getting into one of the most propagated myths in the homebrew world. But um. <laughs> it's, all, it's better the third or fourth time we try to use the exact same pun. <laughs> and that is the myth of thermal shock, the idea that uh, if you throw uh, cold yeast into warm beer, it'll ruin the yeast. And it'll stress it out and it doesn't make good beer. Yeah. Pause for a minute because Barry's coming in. So I think we've done a pretty good lead in. I don't know where we left off, but let's just go ahead and cut to Jess and Owen explaining the differences between packaging and something like Y yeast versus Imperial. Why not do a smack pack? So have activation inside a pouch. Um, one is it's a really small amount of sugar inside that package. Uh, I don't want the yeast to wake up. We, we spend a lot of effort on getting the yeast to become dormant when they have a lot of sugar reserves inside their cells. So when they wake up, they can um, be healthy and very viable and go to town on your wort when they I want the yeast to be exposed to sugar inside your um, fermentation vessel not before that uh, if you do smack the 
or activate your pack a day in advance, the yeast is going to wake up, be excited that there's a little bit of sugar, uh, eat it, and then start starving. And it's a pretty easy way to um, uh, to stress your culture out at a part of the process where it's not a great idea to do that. We recommend just pitching these cold into the wort. Um, you know, there's thousands of breweries around the world. I'd say. 99.9% .9 of them are pitching cold yeast into wort. It doesn't make sense for a brewery to, to take cold yeast, try to warm it up on a large scale, and then shoot it into the wort. Um, I think the amount of stress that is caused by that uh, small difference in temperature is not a huge deal. Um, I think it's more detrimental to take that yeast, warm it up, and have it hanging out at a nice warm temperature without any nutrients. I think you can likely do way more damage to your yeast that way than the small amount of shock it may experience at a, let's say, 30 degree change. The internet does lie to you from time to time. <laughs> We're one of a few labs that will take the time to concentrate or dilute every strain to make sure that you're getting a consistent pitch. Uh, we're the only lab to uh, pour off our supernatant at the end of fermentation uh, that I know of. So we're decreasing alcohol and increasing pH really early on in the process. Uh, so we're getting better viability over time. By cell, I think we're the cheapest people in the industry. So yeah, thermal shock, not really a thing. Packaging is different, but uh, you also heard probably a little bit in that why uh, viability and cell count are really important versus, you know, you're not normally getting another pitch because prices also another myth, right? Ha, said that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, actually. Uh, uh, you know, it's saving money is one thing, but uh, saving money at the expense of the quality of your product final product final beer is a, is a bad is another thing i don't know where logan's going with that he definitely lost his mojo but when you spend ten dollars on an imperial packet as they said you're getting it's the, the cheapest per cell and it's not just per cell in general but per viable cell uh, per cell that's going to be working well to make your beer consistent uh, and giving you the right pitch rate well I think that just about does it for this video. Hope you all enjoyed. Don't forget to like, subscribe, throw down your comments, tell me how bad I was. Yeah, he really tanked towards the end of this video. Tanked it, tanked it. Anyway, see you next time on Genius Brewing. I'm out of tea. That's all she wrote. I'm out of coffee too. Time to switch to beer. Whoa!